the presidential candidate of the African Action Congress, uh, Omoyele Shore, has said that was the escalating insecurity in Nigeria may not have about 25% of its landmass hold free and fair elections in 2023. Now, the presidential candidate of the African Action Congress said that the deployment of the bimodal voter accreditation system, Beavers, in the 2023 general elections will address Nigeria's perennial problem of election rigging. He said the current insecurity in the country poses a great threat for free and fair elections next year, as well as all the regions in the country have peculiar security challenges, adding that he has not fallen out of favor with youths and young Nigerians, that they still see him as a better alternative to other contenders. Joining us live to discuss this is Omoyele Shore, the presidential candidate of the African Action Congress, AAC. So good to have you join us. Happy New Year. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there's nothing happy and new in the year anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, at least you saw a new year. Yes. That's the important thing. Let's start with what you just said, saying that democracy is not... Um, let me start by, you know, looking at the other issues of beavers, because um, many people have been um, cautioned to say um, positive things about the beavers. The, INEC thinks that the beavers is going to be a game changer. A lot of other people actually think that, but you don't seem to agree with that. Why? It is because I have a very good knowledge of computers. And I understand them to the point that a beavers is not going to change the game in an election in which we don't have electronic voting. Mm -hmm. A beavers, as they call it, is just your cell phone uh, in double modes. You know, so, and um, <clears throat> it switches offline and online. According to what they said, I've never touched one before. So I don't know how effective they are of online. But I know that they have preloaded voters' information, I mean, voter information for every voter that uh, might have registered or received their um, voters' cards, mm -hmm. the, the term we refer to as a permanent voters' card. Mm -hmm. So, but that's how it, that's the end of it. You know, the aspects of uh, vote buying is not captured by beavers. And the limitation of beavers or the weaknesses of beavers was shown in a shown election, you know, uh, judgment. It showed that both political parties, the APC and the, um, the APC and the PDP, were able to obtain different results from the same beavers. How did that happen? It shows that. This is a machine that can be programmed to achieve whatever results you but want. But INEC had come out to explain why that happened. What did they say? Well, INEC said that um, before, that one party came before the information was fed out of the beavers, and the yeah. other came when it had already been fed out of the beavers. No, that's not true. You know, so information about voters' card cannot change whether the beavers is sleeping or is awake. The moment the election is over, whatever is produced out of beavers should not change forever. So it's a functional program. That's why I said so a little bit about because INEC has recently been complaining about the fact that there might be a hack that people have been have been attacking. Well, they did not present any information that this was hacked. But if beavers can be hacked, then forget about beavers. Forget about them. And I'm sure what they're saying is that look, whenever you get a result that is not what you expect, we we'll use hacking as an excuse. So that's the reason why I'm saying. Look, every why time there's an why election... Why do, you, why do you think INEC is making that excuse? Why would, because you, it sounds like that's what you're saying, that INEC is making an excuse that in case you don't get a good result, it might be the hackers. Yeah. Why would you think that that's what they're aiming at? Because they're, pro they're pro programming you to understand that this may not come out the way you expect. Because the reason I wanted to take you back a little bit was uh, the card readers. When card readers were brought into Nigeria, everybody said it's a game changer. You know, nobody's going to... The incident forms. The card readers never really worked mm -hmm. up to maybe 15% of the country at any time. Even in 2015, the card readers couldn't read the voter's card of the president at that time. Yes, Good luck, Jonathan. Yes. But that was how it was presented because there's a lot of uh, PR behind all these efforts. What would have solved Nigeria's problem? It's electronic voting, which will eliminate polling units. It will eliminate, you know, the whole processing that have to take place after you have left the polling unit. You will eliminate vote buy. If you're going to buy votes, you have to reach people individually in their homes, and that will take a lot of energy and time and money. It also helps people 
to not have to travel to the polling units to vote. It's just like saying to you that you have money in the bank. You can transfer it anywhere. And if you can trust a device to transfer money for you, you should be able to trust it to vote for you once in every four years. Mm -hmm. Oh, how but many the, times? But then the vote? Constitution is where that empowerment will come from. And I want to ask you, uh, you have been pushing for a lot of things. How come you were not one of those who were in the forefront of pushing for electronic voting? I mean, we had a whole nah, row been, over what should be and should not be. No, I've been pushing like for act. I've been pushing for revolutionary changes to Nigeria's life. Specifically, this one that you and this involves about. electronic revolution too, mm -hmm. that we can't be stuck in the past. And I've been pushing for constitutional changes. I've been pushing for a complete you know, new constitution for Nigeria. So if I'm pushing for constitutional changes, I'm saying people should come there and determine how they want to vote as well. These are issues that we covered in the constitutional conference that determines the future of Nigeria. We'll discuss everything under the sun. We'll discuss from voting to religious rights, sexuality, everything. Mm -hmm. That's everything we're we going to come to some of those things, but I want yeah. to dial back again on this issue um, of electronic voting um, because you see a lot of people pushed like I said there was a row about what should be and what shouldn't be and Mr. President signing off or not signing off why do you think that this wasn't a priority again there's also the issue of diaspora voting which of course if we exactly. have it's, it's voting, exactly what I'm saying I've been talking about diaspora voting since 2018 when I traveled around the world talking to Nigerians and Places as far flung as Australia. I traveled, I traveled in four cities in Australia. I didn't know that Australia was that big, you know, because we're the western part of Australia. You know, we went to the east and we came back to the west. It was amazing. So I talked to Nigerians. I went to Canada. I went to South Africa, and everything I was saying was like, you know, and that is the basis for my position on electronic voting because it affects diaspora voting too. So what the diasporans will just do is to get a code and, you know, ask them, the code, the, the, the electronic thing will not change your location so that we know where you are voting from, number one. And I know you can say that, well, they can override that with uh, this other tool, but there's a way we can, we can also detect that. And then you can vote as a diasporan. If you can show that you are Nigerian, so in the, your own case, maybe you ask for your passport number, you register. If we can find it in the system, it will give you the go-ahead to vote. You just need to check, uh, you have a checklist. Mm -hmm. And when you reach that position, it will give you the ballot paper electronically, you know, a digital ballot paper, and you check who you want to vote for. If you vote for more than one person, he will warn you. You know, you do it a third time, it locks you out of the machine. You have to get another, that means you disqualified yourself. But, but and these things are simple. Yes, I, I like it when politicians say, oh, it's very simple. I'm not a politician. Yeah. I'm well, a political activist. Well, you're running for a political office, so I would, category, I would lump you with them. But here, here we are unable to transfer our monies. We can't even get access to mobile applications that, you, that open into your bank platforms for you to access your monies. Um, our internet services, we hear they're 5G, but then they give us 3G speed. And several other issues that we have yet to be able to deal with. And we're talking e-voting. Okay. I mean, if we're unable to deal with these issues, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't. No, no, I, no I want, I want, I want to address them. I want to address them. What are you say? I'm not saying e-voting we care at all. But it's just, you know, when you vote with your device, there are digital footprints that are easy to track. And it's different from someone voting 500 times in a polling unit in the Niger Delta Creeks. You get my point? Because today, if you go to Niger Delta, which is where I come from, anything beyond the land parts, anything happening in the creeks, there is no polling unit officer that can control it. The moment the police get on a boat, one police in it, they will just tell the policeman to go and sit somewhere. It's when they are done with the voting, they will carry everything and give and send it to you. But the electronic voting will solve that. And, but to make it clear to you, there are over 124 million people in Nigeria that own bank accounts. Mm -hmm. And almost 100 and something million of them carry out electronic activities. There are over 150 smart, 50 million smartphones in Nigeria. 
150 million. How many people are registered to vote? 93 million. So that means, you know, the number of voters are less than the number of people who have access to smartphones because these are digital devices that need to be smart. So the excuse is no longer there. Yes, you have like fringe persons, older people who might need help. So we can create polling units for them, but you can ask them to vote in advance. You do early voting. They do it already in America. America doesn't vote on voting day anymore. You can vote before, but you can't vote after the voting day. All their military people, people outside the country, they vote. They send in what they call mail-in ballots. You have mail-in ballots in the U.S. now, and you also have, you know, uh, ballots that are sent from, from outside the U.S. Yeah. They're all mail-in ballots. And they are counted in advance, but they don't announce the results because their processes are transparent and honest. So, and those ones form part of the election, but when it's the D-Day, people come out and vote. Yeah. And I'm not saying that, you know, everything that is done in America is not done in America should be done here. Mm -hmm. But if you can drive American cars, you should be able to operate American voting machines. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about Nigeria and Nigeria's problems. Um, let's start with the very cliche things that we ask politicians or anybody who's running for office. I mean, as we speak right now, there, it's a potpourri of issues that Nigeria is facing on every side, whether it be in the education sector, with the INEC, um, sorry, um, ASU is still at an impasse with the presidency mm -hmm. and, of course, uh, the Ministry of um, Education. And Education. Yeah. Um, we're also having a brain drain situation within our healthcare system. I mean, the emergency services are flawed as we speak. Uh, and, and then let's talk about the economy. Nigeria is facing corruption issues every day. Um, and then, of course, the issue of security. Um, for anybody who wants to run for president of this country, I always wonder why and what the driving force is. And, and where do you even start to deal with these issues? You start to deal with the issues as you prepare to handle them. That's why you see most of these candidates would never come on your TV show. Because they cannot even withstand the rigors of a decent or even a polite you know, interaction on TV. They also don't go for debates. The only thing they like to do is what they call rallies. These are echo chambers. You know, you pack the stadium full with people who haven't been paid 5,000 naira. Now it's less because there's no cash. Um, and then you entertain them, titillate, titillate them, and, you know, tickle their fancy. And then the candidate comes around for five minutes. He dances around, and then he says a few things. Nothing. That's, even the media can't get any sound bites from campaign crowds or campaign rallies. This is not how to engage. So I understand the issues. You, you are talking about, I mean, as of today, we have a full-blown energy crisis. The electricity sector is gone. You know, you can't find petrol uh, to operate anything with. And to compound that, you have a self-inflicted, unprovoked currency crisis. Mm. You know, and Nigeria has practically collapsed, you know, because it has failed the citizens. But Nigeria is officially at this point a failed state, unable to cope with the basic needs, you know, or responsibilities of a state. You don't have, you have money. This is the first time that I know in history that you have to use your own money to buy money to get anything money can buy. But you, you don't know. see... Because so it's not only security that is a problem. Every sector has broken down. We have a food crisis as well. You have an energy crisis. You have a currency crisis. You have an educational crisis. You have brain drain, as you call it. Over 8,000 doctors have left. Several nurses. 1,000 uh, more getting ready. To yes. More, you know, architects. I heard as of two weeks ago, they're asking for teachers. I mean, teachers that were reserving for heaven. For their reward, they are, they are now about to get their reward on earth. So tell me what's left. So it's to understand that the solution would, must start now, and it must start with somebody who understands the problems, not somebody who created the problems. Because that's what Nigerians understand that there are two categories of contestants in this election circle, and it doesn't matter how you uh, how you say it. The majority of people who the media refers to as the frontline candidates are the ones who created the problems. How do you mean? They, they have been the ones who've been in power. There's one of them that's been in power for since 1999, Kwa Kwanso. 
He was a minister of uh, defense. He was a member of House of Red. Was governor for two years. A senator, you know, Tinubu was a senator at a point in his life. He was eight years the governor of Lagos. Uh, Atiku was eight years the vice president of Nigeria. He's been in customs. You know, Peter Obi has been eight years governor of uh, Anambra State. These are the guys who created the problems. How did they create the problem? Because you see, um, they every, the every problem time you of... want to have a, a, an election, mm -hmm. yes, your guys, people like you, they wax very lyrical. You tell us. That no, that would be, that that would be demeaning to say that we wax lyrical. I don't wax. I'm not a, a poet. Lot of, a lot of you I'm, come up with very, very, very germane ideas that oh, yeah, we can do this because we, we because we know it. But then whoever you know gets the most votes is seated there. And then the problems that we were promised will get solved are not being solved. But that's exactly the point. So, 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 so I don't belong to the category of people who wax lyrics. What am I waxing lyric about? What? The last time I was on this show with you, what was I talking about? I was talking about the revolution. I got arrested. You're probably the last person to interview me before I got arrested I remember. in 2019. So how do I wax like? Didn't I tell you that we're planning a revolution? We said, and didn't we do it? We tried to, and I ended up in detention. But so I'm a doer, I'm not a talker. But again, now... So I'm not waxing the Maybe I can't just do that. No, now no. Nigerians are looking deeper. They're asking more questions, which I think is a good thing. And for somebody like you, okay, well, yes, Sahara reporters, you journalist, revolution uh, activist, but why should we entrust the whole country into your hands? Because when the country needed people to take risk, big risk, it was entrusted into our hands. Do you know what our risk was? Military rule. It was bigger than what we have now at that time. I was 22 years old when I was fighting to save this country. Nobody said I was too young. But, you know, why should we entrust a 22-year-old guy to be fighting on the streets for democracy? Nobody said that. Majority of the people who you now said have experience, you know, uh, people who are experienced in looting treasuries, when the solution was asked for, they didn't partake. Until today, they are not part. They only partake in the loot when they win. Then they call themselves, you know. And there are no differences because in every government, you'll be surprised how many people are working for a government. Sometimes some of the opposition people you are seeing now, they were created by the current government to be in the opposition. Even if you look at the APC now, their candidate is waxing like an activist, you know, at the rally grounds, you know. He's suddenly opposed to the economic policies that brought Naira from 200 Naira to 800. Um, like, he just woke up and discovered that the Naira's value, I mean, Naira's value is, like, depreciated heavily. But that's the tactic. It's the strategy they use in confusing the country. I'm not confused. So I know think, what they're about. Think, I'm sure you saw El Rafai's interview yes. talking about accusing some elements, and yeah. we do not know who those elements are, in Asorok, that he um, reportedly said are uh, working against the APC's presidential candidate. What yeah. do you think about that situation? And of course, the wife of the president it, retweeted it said, yes. his post. Yeah, but you see, they know themselves, and he is right. You know, I, I was I was the first to mention it on um, Rice TV a week before he said that. But that's not my business. I hope they actually, you know, uh, tear themselves apart so that this country can have a new leash of life. But it's also part of their strategy. They know how to distract Nigerians. So you are there, like unable to get Schneider out of the ATM, you have no petrol, and nobody's talking about it. They're talking about, oh my God, there's a cabal out there who's, who doesn't want this sort of candidate, and everybody's like, why, you know? While that is happening, you're losing time, you're losing integrity, you're losing life, you're losing value. They know it, you know, they know, they know that the country is in turmoil. There's a currency crisis in place, which they inflicted. When they started their useless currency redesign, I came out and said they're not going to, re they're not redesigning the Naira, they merely took it to snapshot, filtered it out, and poor die on 1,000 naira. Nothing was, was not, all the currencies were just change of die, not design. And now, you can't even find the money because they didn't have the capacity in the first place to print enough of those notes to deal with the demand for it. The supply side of it is a problem. But what did they tell people? And some people still believe today, stupidly, that this was to ensure that you know the rich people have uh, the big politicians don't have money to buy votes. Like I said it, and I think uh, so repeated it a few days ago. On Channel's TV. I granted an interview pre-recorded to Channel's TV that I'll play on Monday. 
And I said, it's like, most of the candidates here claim we have no money. They own banks. And it's been well known that the best way to rob a bank is to own one. So if you own a bank, you know, the one in Lagos has at least probably three banks that he has major share, shares in. Peter Abu is the owner of Fidelity Bank. You know, Article has, yes, he's the chairman of Fidelity Bank. I'm not making it up. Yes. It's, uh, so if there is new currency, where do you think the bank managers will take the money to first? It's to their chairman and shareholders. Before it gets to the poor people, have you ever seen a governor queue up <laughs> at the ATM? Not even a councillor, because when you are rich, you are connected and powerful in Nigeria, the bank managers work from your home. Interesting. Yes. Let's, let's talk about this same situation. You, you were quoted to say that um, you're calling for a protest against the Buhari government for uh, the scarcity of fuel and the Naira. And we've seen a couple of people protesting already. We saw something in Benin. We saw something in, in the battle. Worry, yes. Now today was the battle, so, yes. Do you not think that you are heating up the polity? With no, they are the ones, they are the ones, they are the ones burning down the country with their policy. They, they ask for it. If you know that you're going into an election and you're changing currency colors and you don't have enough and you give a deadline, you are the one calling for trouble. I'm not the one who went and said people should not be able to withdraw more than 20,000 naira. You know, you put pressure on the electronic side of things. Almost all the apps have collapsed. You asked, you asked that before. And, you know, for, the, the apps are not working for two reasons. One, apps cannot transfer what you don't have. <laughs> so it's more it's because money in circulation doesn't have anything to do with paper money. Mm. Yes, both electronically you can only circulate what you have. So, and there's a certain amount of money you know that you have in circulation at this point. So they don't have the money. Beside that, most of the banks have lost some of their best hands, you know, uh, computer engineers who run their back end, so brain drain. So they are just passing together their apps because the maintenance side of things, people who understand how these apps were built, how they have to be maintained and fixed when they have bugs. Most of them have left to Canada, US, and the United Kingdom and the Europe. So they don't have the capacity but in most of the there's no money to actually transfer. How long do you see this um, lingering for? Again, don't forget, we're 23 days, I guess, um, away from the election. No, let's say, what, what that makes you think is... You How know, long can Nigerians you know, continue to hold on for? Yes, that's a good question. And I think you're starting to see resistance. And I think this is how it starts. Resistance will grow, and one day everybody will, uh, will join in. You know, my, my own conspiracy theories that maybe this is their own way of sabotaging the elections. So the elections don't How hold. So? Well, so if, the elections would not hold? Yes, Why? They, 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 you know, if you're putting booby traps like this on the part of elections, a number of things are likely to happen. One, even INEC is saying that they are not sure based on the situation with full scarcity and now lack of money that elections might not be, might not be holding. Uh, the other aspect of it is this is a demobilization strategy to make sure that voters, if I have to travel to Hindu State and I don't have 20,000 Naira now and it's 24 days away, how do I get there? Hmm. You know, how do I get fuel to go to Oweri if I'm still in Lagos and, and there's, no, there's no help in sight, there's no solution in sight to show that this will help in a few days. So if the currency crisis goes on, first scarcity continues. How do you get to location? How do you even get voting materials to get to where they are supposed to be? And if there are flashes of resistance, you know, maybe next they are burning down INEC offices. We don't want to like, you don't know anything can happen. It's a volatile situation. And I think my view is that maybe they actually did put this together. Because there have been people who are talking about interim government, you know, not too long ago. Hmm. Maybe they are reminding you that they're serious. Let's go back to the issue of insecurity. Um, in the past week, we've had two issues or uh, situations where one was, according to the police, a drone that dropped a bomb, um, I think in Nasarawa, and the second was an unidentified aircraft, according to security agencies, that shot at vigilantes in Niger State. And I asked the simple question, why are we not talking about this? Why are we not escalating it? Because our airspace is supposed to be protected, even as we are touting ourselves as a country that's fighting insecurity <laughs> and terrorism. Why do you do you believe 
that there is a conspiracy of silence as, as to what's happening in terms of security across the country? Oh, yeah. You know, there is nowhere that you have insecurity of this scale anywhere in the world. And it's simple, that there is no official collaboration. The only reason insecurity has persisted this way it has is because people are benefiting from it. You know, seriously. Who do you think these people are? You know, there are people higher up there, you know, army generals. Huh? Yeah, the army generals are, you know, senior security officials who benefit. You don't need to go far. When uh, Jonathan left in 2015 and Buhari came and people, you know, in those days that Buhari was acting like he's fighting corruption and he set up a high-powered uh, panel to investigate all the military leaders. What did they find? They found money in uh, Sokeres, they found in... Uh, What's those escalated water tanks, you know, um, everywhere. They found money everywhere. So it's the same. They, it's just the personnel have changed, but the characteristics of these high power people have not changed. When you hear about oil theft, do you think people are carrying crude in uh, gallons? You know, you see all those badges that take crude. There was one that even escaped from Nigeria and they, you know, said they caught it in uh, Equatorial Guinea. But what I know about these badges is that they cannot move as fast as uh, Navy boats. So how come, why is it that the Navy can't catch up with it? And if you can't catch up with, with the Navy boat, what happened to naval helicopters that can just make sure that they are stopped at all costs? But what it's telling you is that the people who are doing those high profile, high level, high scale oil thefts are in the NMPC and probably in the presidency. Because there's a lot of money to be made from. Some of them are state governors. Interestingly, Mr. President, is the Ministry of Petroleum, and there's been a lot of um, scandal surrounding the oil and gas sector. Yeah. Uh, the NNPC has been rechristened again and given added limited to it. Uh, and before the year ended, we had not at any point been mm. able to um, put any monies in the nation's coffers. Yes. Um, and yet, Mr. President hasn't really said anything about it. So, what one thing you must understand about this current president is that he's totally not in charge of anything. Excuse me? I'm serious. He's not in charge of the country. The country the is being run is by... The commander-in-chief of no, the Air no, Force. No, no, no. He's in charge it's, of the country. What do you yeah, mean by yeah, we, are, we have to be serious now. Well, and, I'm serious. Yeah, you're serious. But I'm a little bit more serious than, you know, typically we should be. And it is that seriousness that will take us to the truth. There's just rogue units you know, what we call cabals in the presence that are running the country. You know, one is run by his uncle, his wife is controlling one, the attorney general is in one. At the point where they wanted to edge out the attorney general, the attorney general had got married to the president's daughter so that he could regain his past. The, the, you know, governance in this country is a joke and we must accept that. So they just use the president as, uh, you know, you know what they call marionettes, you know, like somebody hides in the hand and they use a number of ropes and fingers to control. That's what's Buhari is to Nigeria today. <clears throat> and all of us know this fact. And that's what Eru Fai... Did you say that our no, no. president is a puppet on string? Absolutely. Um, that's what Eru Fai is saying, you know. That's what the Eru Fai was saying when he said some people in the presidency are against the party. And the, the, the presidency came out and said, no, we don't know those people. Because just like the former secretary of... Uh, uh, of the federal government was, was saying when he was fired, and they confronted him, uh, that's uh, Babache Lawa, confronted him media, confronted him, said, do you know you've been fired? He said, by who? He said, presidency, which presidency? So that sums up the dysfunctionality of Buhari's uh, presidency. Now, the avid Nigerian, of course, as we speak now, is um, in a state of confusion because it's either they're trying to get fuel, they're trying to get Naira, or they're PVCs. Um, what's, should, what's the message for the persons who are watching, the avid Nigerian who's going through it? Because, you see, that's the new slang that every Nigerian is saying. So, I'm going through a lot. I'm yeah, going through it. I, you know, Nigerians are going through some of their worst times in history. And it's going to get worse if... They, you know, if they keep voting for the wrong people or they allow wrong people to take over the electoral process. <clears throat> I use an analogy a lot, which is a proverb about the axe and the forest and trees. That there was a time trees in the forest uh, were looking for a leader. 
And they said they couldn't trust themselves. You know, it's just like young people today. Yeah, I can't trust this one. I can't trust this. They said, okay, let's go and get somebody who is not part of the forest. And they went and brought the axe. And they were like, but this is axe. It's going to hurt us. You know, and the oldest tree in the, in the forest said, no. Can't you see the handle? It's made of wood. And they made the axe come into the forest. And since they did, every tree in the forest has been going down. Well, Omae Leshore is the uh, presidential candidate of the African Action Congress. Always a pleasure to have you in the studio. Thank you so much for having me again. I hope I don't get arrested. I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a quick break. Thank you for staying with us. And when we return, we'll be discussing Governor Samuel Tom's latest press release over threat to his life. Stay with us. <laughs>